So Tile Brothers, come on out here. This, they, you know, the reason I had these guys on the stage is because I think if the, if the next generation doesn't do more than we've done, the world is screwed. And um, I met uh, Sujay, uh, and then he told me about Shiel, and I thought, wow, when I started hearing some of the things that they were up to, I, I didn't want to like stroke their egos, and I hope that they continue to keep them somewhat in check. But the fact is, they're doing extraordinary things, and they are, what's say, you're 19, and how old are you now? I'm 21. 21, okay, their brothers are 19 and 21. I want them each first just to tell us a little bit about themselves, and then I want to talk about, you know, what, how they look at the world. So, CJ, you want to just quickly yeah, no, give us a little short absolutely. bio yourself? Absolutely, well, first of all, thanks, David, for inviting us here. I think a lot of the people here in the, com the companies are companies that, you know, I was born, you know, when they were getting started, or they've started when I've been a teenager, and so I've been following them very actively, so it's great to see a lot of those people in the audience here today. Um, my background's a little bit weird, and it's kind of taken, sh it's kind of taken different shape in different interests. Um, you know, I started uh, when I was 10 or 11 years old doing clean energy research, and uh, ended up doing about six years of clean energy research, creating a technology to take cellulose into bioethanol for much cheaper than what's commercially available. And um, worked at companies like DuPont and uh, and Mascoma when I was you know, 13 years old, 14 years old. He started um, working at DuPont when he was 13. Yeah, and, um, and I, I just want to say that. <laughs> um, it's, it was actually kind of a funny. And you have story. A, quite a few bio, you have several biofuel patents, right? We, I have. Uh, there's been a lot of publications from the lab uh, on, on biofuel development, but um, you know, I, it was a funny story about DuPont. I actually, they they didn't allow me legally to work at DuPont when I was 13, and so uh, I had to beg somebody to let me in, and you know, I was on none of the HR records, and basically had to sneak in and out of the labs whenever there was an inspection in order to work really? there. And so, and so I don't know how publicly I should say I worked there, quote unquote. But um, no, so I did six years of biofuel research, and I went to, um, I went to Harvard when I was 15. Um, ended up doing about three years of school there, kind of pursuing this environmental sciences passion. And in my third year of school, Peter Thiel uh, offered this 20 under 20 fellowship, and I thought it was an amazing opportunity. I loved being in the real world, interacting with great entrepreneurs, and um, got one of those fellowships, left school, and I've been working on a mobile company now, actually, for the last 13 months in Los Angeles, um, kind of tackling mobile distribution, mobile gaming, because it's been an interest of mine. And, um, it's just been a fascinating journey. But I know you intend to get back to energy eventually, right? That's the goal. I mean, I think, I think one of the things I wanted to do coming out of school was work with an incredible team, build an incredible team, raise money, um, and see a product from conception to commercialization. And you know, starting in bioenergy, I think the product life cycle is 10, 15 years. It's very difficult to do that and kind of stick with it as the first thing you ever do. And so I wanted to work on something that had a completely opposite life cycle, which I thought was mobile apps and cool. um, build them out. We've raised a few rounds of funding, about almost 50 people now, so. Great, yeah. and you've got a pretty senior role there. Yeah. Um, I've, been, I've been blessed to, to, yeah, to be up there and kind of see the company from the top down. That's cool. Shield, just give us a quick bio. Yeah, so uh, I think the difference between Sujay and I is I have a college degree, um, <laughs> which, <laughs> which these days, I don't know if that makes me more set up for success or less set up for success. Um, but, so I graduated from Stanford. I was uh, 19, I was working at a company while I was at Stanford. I ended up realizing that there's this thing called venture capital, where this industry basically promotes the next generation of innovation. You work with entrepreneurs who are changing lives. And I tried to do everything I could to get into venture capital. So I, uh, I actually got an internship while I was in school at a firm called Bessemer, ended up joining them full time, did a lot of emerging market stuff for them and then joined another firm, NEA, about six months ago. Um, and I, one of the reasons I joined Bessemer and then NEA is I heard the story of a company called Celtel. And Bessemer had seeded this company, Celtel, and it, it's effectively the company that brought the mobile phone to Africa. And I heard stories where um, you, had, you had like a Nigerian woman who now had access to the mobile phone and could suddenly order products on her mobile phone for her salon in the city center in Lagos, which was 100 miles away. And that allowed her to stay at her salon and make enough income so her salon could be in the black. And that was all because of Celtel. And so I wanted to do everything I could to get into an industry where I could promote that. And so my main job is, is NEA. And then on the side, when I was running around 
different countries, I realize that there are a lot of young people who are creating innovations, creating companies that are changing lives around them. Like a 19-year-old uh, in, in Kenya who's purifying water, who's selling bottled water at half the cost of importers, um, uh, which effectively means that more people now have access to clean water than ever before, making six figures in profit, and is 19, but not getting venture funded. So I was like, you know, I now have a small savings account, nothing meaningful, but a small savings account. So um, what if I invest personally? What if I invest twenty to thirty thousand dollars in each one of these companies, and rally other people who can, who can uh, invest more, and hope to create an ecosystem of promoting youth entrepreneurship, not just in the U.S. where people know it's here, but around the world where it also is there. Okay, so you dropped out of Harvard after three years at 18. You graduated Stanford at 19. But in the meantime, several years ago, you guys started a nonprofit in India. Real quickly, just talk about that. Yeah, um, we, started, we started a nonprofit called Recite together uh, when we were, you know, I was still in high school. Um, and we, had both our, we both have very poor eyesight. And uh, obviously our family is, uh, was originally from India. And we thought there was a lot of nonprofits in the space that were tackling um, the problem of eye care and underprivileged people who have eye disease and giving them access to surgery or you know, glasses or whatever that may be. But you know, we took a step back and said, there's actually two sides of this problem. It's not just that they're blind, but they're also impoverished. And so there's nobody solving the dichotomy here. Like People are solving the blindness issue, but at the end, they're still impoverished. And so yeah, we actually took see, people. You can't work you know, in many of these countries. So yeah. that's the tough part. And so we kind of tried to solve that entire cycle and you know, entered, partnered with several hospitals in India, gave them the funds in order to fund the surgeries of impoverished people, and then actually employed those people to go identify the next batch of patients. Yeah. So it becomes a very cyclical process. So you're really currently trying to help people get eyesight, eye, eye care, and, and glasses, basically. Yeah, the point is, you know, so I was doing a little bit of retinal cell biology research when I was in high school, and that was hard. I was not a PhD. I, I didn't know a lot of the biological pathways that I needed to know to make change. But what I realized is there are a over 100 million people in this world with treatable blindness, even more with vision impairments that can be treated. But it's a simple distribution problem, right? I mean, the treatments are out there already. So although I was tinkering around trying to figure out a pathway that could eventually create a solution that might solve macular generation, it didn't really matter if people are out there who can access glasses or can access cataract surgeries even though those treatments are already there. So we're like, what if we don't need a PhD to solve a distribution problem, right? So that's what we were trying to do. OK, well, the fact is they're actually having some impact on this eyesight problem. And they did that on the side with all this other stuff going on. The point I really want to ask you, I mean, when I was your age, I was like getting stoned. And the most productive thing I was doing <laughs> was getting arrested to, to you know, maybe for fighting the Vietnam War. Uh, and, and, and feeling very virtuous, you know, while I was getting stoned while I was doing that. Um, so. What I want to know is what do you guys think your lives so far say about your generation? And should those of us who worry about the state of the world and see all these challenges that must be addressed be a little more optimistic when we look at you? Or are you guys just aberrations who are weird because you did come from a life of great privilege? I mean, your parents had money and your father was a pretty senior executive in a major corporation. So it's not like you struggled up from a little village or anything. But, but you clearly have taken your lives extremely seriously, which, which I, I much admire. I just want to know, what do we make of that? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, America should lower their drinking age because it's very difficult for me to go to meetings and can't get into the actual venues where these meetings are taking place. <laughs> and so that's a good one. Um, I think that's something that's new from our generation. Um, you know, we we were very blessed by our parents. I, I attribute every single ounce of whatever success may be called. Um, I by no means think I'm successful yet. I think there's a ton of things that I want to tackle and can tackle, and I'm still humbled by everyone I get to meet. Um, but I attribute all of that to my parents. My parents were born and raised in India and you know, never really adhered to status quo. They taught us from a very young age that there are a few rules that you can break, that you strive to break. And those are age barriers on what you can achieve. And I think America has unfortunately put a lot of these age restrictions on what you can do, the minimum age to work in labs, the minimum age to attend university, to go into the working world. And from a young age, they said, why don't you be rebellious, try to break those rules, and you'll discover this world of innovation at a very young age and it'll spark a passion in you. Yeah, and I would just add one thing. So 
Um, to build on Sujay's story of our parents, my parents grew up in India and they applied, they came here, the classic American dream. They applied to graduate schools that didn't have application fees because they couldn't afford the application fee, right? And for them, education gave us and them everything. Today, the world is in a place where that access to education is now universally available. Um, there are companies online that, uh, that help with that. There are, it's, there's technology that just allows you to read news from everywhere. So I don't at all think of us as aberrations. I think we're more representations of uh, really the ambitions of our generation that is more connected uh, than ever before. So um, and now there are more people also than ever before who are hungrier than ever before, right? There is this, this concept of the youth bulge all around the world. Population. I mean, hungrier for success and hungrier and, for success and, and wealth and all the things. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you think about it, I don't have a family to take care of right now. I don't have kids of my own. I don't have anyone tying me down to a specific location. I have nothing else to focus on in my life than you know building out my career as best I can because I'm really passionate about that. And this is the one age in people's life where, like, they can do that. They can. I can travel whenever I want. I can work until 4 a.m. in the morning. And you know, being young and kind of having that passion and drive is the time I think you should do that. When you don't have a family to take care of, when you can afford to innovate. And, um, but you know, when you guys talk to your friends who are your age and, and you talk about all these, you know, your, your, your work in the developing world in India and you know, some of the investments that Shield's making and you've been involved in some of that too, I think in funding entrepreneurs in Kenya and elsewhere. I mean, do they say, what are you talking about? Or are they, are they all saying, I want to help with that too? I mean, I, I give us a little more of your, what do you predict? Are you, about your generation and, and the next five years of the, of the world's future, are we going to see how, how, I guess I just really want to get a flavor of how positive should I be and should we be about you know, what this generation, how seriously this generation is going to take what, what you mentioned, Shield, the aspiration, particularly of those billions of people who are struggling to get something and that's going to raise huge political problems all over the world when those people start to come up and it may start bringing us down. Are the American young people and are the young people of Europe and I, what's the general feeling that we should have about how that's going to play out in your opinion? Because to me, that's one of the biggest questions. Mm -hmm. um. This, it's a tough question. It's a really tough question. I have hopeful, I'm, I'm cautiously optimis, op, optimistic. Um, so to your first question, what do people think when they hear about this? Everybody is supportive. Everybody wants to jump on board. Often people are doing their own amazing things. Um, the second part, there are, there's so many youth in, in the world. I mean, Libya, 50% of Libyans are under the age of 20. You know, in Zimbabwe, 56% of people are between the age of 15 and 29. India's fastest growing population is under the age of 30. So it is a scary situation that the world is in. But because there is so much access to education today, you have to take the youth seriously. I mean, you have to enable them to be in a position such that they can innovate, right? You have to set them up so that they have access to resources, and that's not just financial, it's educational, it's mentorship, it's, it's certain types of technology that are often a basis so you can innovate on top of that. Um, you have to create that ecosystem so they can flourish. So I think as long as we, and I think a lot of people in this room can help with that, as long as we can set up a platform to allow these young innovators, because they're all innovators, everybody's an entrepreneur in the developing world, um, to be able to innovate, then I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm really excited, actually. I'm actually a bit concerned about America's youth right now. And I think, and I think I've, I've kind of seen this a little bit in my, in my few years is, I think one of the biggest problems that America has done is extended this common stable path. And especially when you think about like a top 20, top 30 universities, um, you know, and which is what this room is full of, um, you know, for a long time, it used to be go to middle school, high school, join the family business. And then from there, it got extended to going into an undergrad and then going into industry. And lately, if you think about it, like, it, it's gone from high school to middle school to high school to college. And then from college, you go into four buckets. You go into investment banking, consulting, 
med school, law school. I thought school. you moved home at that point. Yeah, yeah. or yeah, you med school, yeah. law school, then you go and go into business school, or you go become a practicing doctor, and by the time you're 35, 40, you're finally in the real world with a couple of different opportunities. And by that time, you have a family, and it kind of discourages innovation and discourages risk taking. And I think if we can tell our youth that you can be 10 years old, 11 years old, and actually do stuff in the world, you can actually go out and do something, make a difference, then you can kind of get off of this path well, early. Your existence tells us that Eden Full, who's 21 or 20, coming here tomorrow, another Teal fellow, is going to tell us that too. Uh, and I love what you say about the university accessibility, universal accessibility of information enables people like you to exist. But let's hear some comments or questions from anybody else. Who has anything to ask these people or say to them? Or anybody? I, I can keep going with them if you don't want to. Uh, if you're daunted by their, uh, you're intimidated by these guys. Um, yeah. Oh, Steffi, please. It's fabulous what you're doing, but I do you expect no? Um, what? How do you imagine your when you are 50? What if one, what do you want Great to question. have achieved then? You know, I think one of the things that being in venture capital has taught me, and NEA has been a terrific platform for that. They are NEA is the largest fund, and in, in, I think in venture capital and therefore a global fund. Um, it's taught me the general notion of efficient allocation of capital, right? Putting money where there is the largest bang for that buck. And as I've been at NEA, I've also realized that you know who has even more capital that, that, ha that they have to allocate uh, efficiently? The government. So I was thinking, and maybe when I'm 50, maybe when I'm 40, maybe when I'm 60, I don't really know. But at some point, I think I'd like to enter more defined public service where I'm able to efficiently allocate capital to programs, both domestic and abroad, that I think generate disruptive returns. So some notion of public service for me. I want to have 10 stories, 10 stories, 10 unique stories where I've made a very positive impact to some one person's life in 10 different ways. And be it creating a technology that somebody's using that didn't exist before be it bringing eyesight and a job to somebody, just 10 stories by the time I'm 50. And I think I'm maybe at half of one right now. And so. That's good to you. Well, hopefully I won't be a father for a little while, but um, <laughs> yeah, let's hopefully. see. Uh, um, um, how do we teach our children that? And I, I think the same way that my, our parents, I, I was blessed, oh, sorry, I was blessed to, uh, have gotten taught that by my own parents is uh, just exposing them to be a rebel in the right ways at a very early age. Yeah, you know, our parents did something interesting. When we did, uh, and I only realized this when I look back, we didn't take vacations to the developed world. Any time my parents had a break, they took us, so we were in Nairobi in 1998, up until the day before the, the embassy bombing. Um, we went to Rio in, I think it was like 99 or 2000, basically before most American investors were in, you know, were in Brazil. They took us to the real world. They, uh, they, they told us that, you know, the, the t we had this debate in the US, 99%, 1%. Did you know that if you have an income of $34,000 or more, you are in the top 1% of the world? It's like that is therefore, we therefore live in a microcosm. And so they wanted to show us the real world. And so I think when we have kids, um, we would do the same. Show them what the real world is actually like. Well, we probably should have had your parents up here to figure out what the hell happened. But um, <laughs> uh, Ping, did you want to? Did you? Yeah. Let's get a quick question from Ping, and then we're going to have to wrap. I mean, the main thing was just to realize these people exist and draw your own conclusions and talk to them separately. Go ahead, Ping. Ping Fu, um, founder and CEO of Geomagic. I'm so thrilled to see, see you up there because I, I kind of feel like the youth want to be you. And when you're out there um, talking to the youth and working with the youth, how much is that they, they listen to what you say and how much is that they actually want to be you? I think actually they want to be Justin Bieber more than they want to be me. <laughs> um, and actually, that's, it's an interesting point because in many countries in the world, China is a great example. The super, the heroes are people like Bill Gates, right? I mean, you go to these countries, they respect the entrepreneurs and the innovators. Whereas here, the star culture is more celebrities. And celebrities are athletes, musicians, et cetera. That's good, but um, I wish there was more 
I don't know, like Eden Full is a great example. But you Somebody know, Zuckerberg has changed, changed that slightly. That yeah. stupid movie actually helped with that, that a little bit. It did help that. And your but book helped with that. I, th I think, yeah. My book didn't help much, but the movie actually did help quite a bit, even though I hated the movie. And, well, <laughs> I liked the movie, but it just, anyway, I, it, that was a great thing about the movie, is yeah. it really made a lot of people say, hey, it's cool to be an entrepreneur and a geek. Uh, and actually, I think geeks are cooler than they were, but your point is well taken. But we've got to wrap, unfortunately. Thank you so much for the question, Ping. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Really happy Thanks to have you here. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Yeah.